Hello and welcome to Securities Lending Saturday. Today, I'm going to be talking about emerging markets and securities lending in the first of a multi-part series. If you're interested in securities lending because you are an institutional investor, a retail investor, someone that's part of the securities lending ecosystem, or just darn interested about securities lending, then this is the place for you. So let's get to it. I'm Roy Zimmer Hansel. I'm uh, the head of Pierpoint Financial, and every Saturday I provide an element of the fundamentals of securities lending series. Today, I'm talking about a very important part of the ecosystem, which is emerging markets. Emerging markets are very important today because not only does securities lending help smaller markets evolve, it's also an important component of some very large markets that aren't open to true cross-border securities lending activity and have the potential to really transform the business over the coming years. So let me just call up my slide deck and we should be ready to go. There you go. I'm in the corner now and let's talk about what's front and center, emerging markets and securities lending, part one. A quick review of what we've been talking about so far in this 23 week series so far, really a broad range from what is it? Why does it exist through to some very technical areas such as dividend arbitrage and everything in between today, as I said, and over the next couple of weeks, we're probably going to be doing just emerging markets. What I'm going to be looking at is four key issues. One is what are the objectives for an emerging market? So what are regulators looking for? What do politicians want? What do stock exchanges want? Why introduce it, particularly given that we've had short selling bans in both 2020 and of course in 2008 and 2009. So why would you be bringing that in today's marketplace? We're gonna look at four different areas. One is liquidity. Second is price discovery. Number three is related products. And number four is peak trough moderation. Of course, I do this series so that, particularly for places like emerging markets, where often people haven't been exposed to securities lending business, and it's important that they have an understanding as and when their markets become part of the, the universe of the business. But also in developed markets, it's a very niche product. It's a niche of a niche, really. And so it's hard for people to learn about it unless they're directly involved in it. And even if you're directly involved in it, you're probably in one of the vertical slices. You do trading or trade support. You do dividends or interest coverage. You do corporate actions. You do reconciliations. You do setup. You do one of those streams but you don't really get that broad coverage. And that's what this series is about. So if you think that this video today or the series generally has been helpful, please give us a, a, an up thumb. Uh, and if you'd like it and want to get more, so hit the subscribe button. And if you ring the bell, you get notified every time I put up a new video. I usually put up videos Sunday afternoon at about 3 p.m. UK time. So have a look there. Okay, let's talk first about liquidity. The issue is that generally emerging markets have smaller and fewer trading participants than developed markets, hardly a surprise. And so securities lending short selling, now it enables and supports market making activity, which improves the daily turnover and the prices for investors. Market makers, their role is to make certain that if someone wants to buy, that there'll always be a seller for them. And if someone wants to sell, they'll always be a buyer. So market makers are that very important linchpin that keep many markets operating. And of course, so of course, market makers, their job is to be a buyer for every seller and a seller to every buyer and keep the markets functioning that way. Now, when someone wants to buy shares, the market maker has the option, of course, to go into the market and see if anyone's willing to sell it to the market maker so they can on sell. If that isn't available or it's available only at a higher price than the market maker expects for that stock, then one of their natural alternatives is to borrow the securities and do effectively a short sale. They're selling shares they don't own to that buyer. So it keeps the buyer happy and the market maker gets extra support 
and another tool in their arsenal to help liquidity in the markets. And of course, just the act of short selling itself invites new market participants into any given marketplace and increases turnover. More traders equals more trades. But the other interesting thing, which people don't always appreciate, they often think that short sellers are only one directional. They only go in and they short sell the stock and then eventually they buy it back when the price moves uh, for them or against them and they close out their positions. But what they don't really think about is that most of the hedge fund strategies that drive that activity really are balanced in both long and short. So it, many hedge funds will avoid a market if their only option is to be a long investor. When the ability to short sell opens up, now they're interested because they have both the long opportunities and the short opportunities. And often you'll see them have both long and shorts in the same market. Absent the ability to short sell, they won't go into the market at all. So it's really important for that aspect of liquidity. As I said, short sellers bring additional short sale trades and subsequent long purchases, either to close out positions, or as I said, the long part of their portfolio strategies. The other thing which I wanted to really mention is that it creates conditions for other trading activity, right? So if you have other securities there, then what you're likely to see is uh, if there's two stocks in the same industry, one of the typical market neutral hedge fund strategies would be, they would be long the company that they think is good in that sector, short the company that they think is bad. And absent the ability to short that stock, they aren't going to go long that, that stock. And if they can do those trades, then what you have is a better price for both of them. This is all about price discovery, which I'll talk about in a minute. The potential concern, of course, for anyone wanting to introduce it for the first time is they're afraid of the potential for short selling to destabilize the market. And so that's a huge concern because once you let the genie out of the bottle, it's hard to get it back inside. So will it short, uh, will short selling destabilize less liquid stocks? And, and certainly that remains a risk, but when you go through the process of what's the availability of lending and in a new market, there will be very few lenders as opposed to well-developed markets where maybe up to 20% of institutional investors will make their securities available for loan. In a new market, you're lucky to find the first one. And the first one doesn't come unless there's a second one and everyone's always waiting for someone else to be first. So look, it takes a while to build up that supply. And if the short selling requires a locate of available securities to borrow before doing the short sale, again, you've got a limitation there because the supply is limited. So that means the size of any potential short sale is gonna be limited as well, okay? So it creates conditions whereby you do have a natural evolution. As you get more supply come on board and you get more short selling activity, that drives liquidity in the market, which increases turnover and liquidity draws liquidity. So what you have is this kind of growth pattern which is self-correcting in many ways. So I think it's a valid concern, something to watch for. And the benefit of new markets bringing in uh, the business today is that they can bring in the regulations that have been seen to work elsewhere and surveillance technology to try and identify and spot problems. So liquidity, a key reason, one of the main reasons why, in fact, probably the main reason why people that or markets that haven't enabled securities lending and short selling enable it or improve it. Price discovery, I mentioned, uh, look, I'm just going to read this out because there's no point in me trying to recreate the definitions uh, from places like Investopedia. So price discovery is the overall process of spedding, setting the spot price. That's the, that means the one for immediate execution of an asset, a, a security, a commodity or a currency. And so what we're talking about here is stocks and bonds, commodities like gold, there's an active borrowing and lending market in there. And of course, all of these instruments trade as do currencies. So anything where there is trading has price discovery, where there's multiple inputs from different parties on their view on it. And as it says, it looks at a number of tangible and intangible factors, including supply and demand. And, and remember, all prices really are set based on the supply of assets that are available for sale 
and the demand to buy those assets. If you have lots of supply, little demand, prices are dropping. If there's huge demand and little supply, prices are going up. And that's just how all markets, simply put, it's where a buyer and seller agree on a price and a transaction occurs. That's price discovery. And so short selling has an impact on that price discovery equation. Again, as I said a, a moment ago, emerging markets have fewer market participants than developed markets. And what happens is by bringing short sellers in, what you're doing is you're introducing new market participants with different perspectives that could be long or could be short. And so it makes it better for the right price to come up because you've got more views coming in. Of course, the role of securities lending is uh, as supply for the short sales. And as we talk about here, covered short sales, as opposed to naked short sales. So what you have is those short sellers, of course, can't participate in that engagement of adding their views, adding their trades to the, to the marketplace without being able to borrow the, sh the securities. And so what I talk about here by with reducing the risk of destabilizing markets. It's that process of making certain you can locate the shares, borrow them before doing the short sale. So it's really critical as a self-regulating practice. Now, absent any kind of short selling uh, approval, so markets where short selling isn't allowed today, the only people setting the prices for stocks are those people that want to buy, those people that continue to hold them, because they've been previous purchasers or other investors who used to be positive about them uh, needing to sell for whatever reason, but probably that the stock has risen as far as they expect, they have better alternative purchases, whatever it is, the motivation is one of just disgorging themselves of the position rather than saying, this is a bad company. They just want to sell. And what they don't want to do is sell into bad news. So even if they think it's a bad company, they're not telling anyone because they want to sell it. Okay. So what you have is a, a bias towards an upward skew, and that certainly isn't a fair price. Okay. And as I say, the more positive and more negative views that you can have on a security that gives investors and potential investors different opinions about where the price should be and what the outlook for the company is, the more likely you are to have a fair price in future. The third point is related products. So this very much is <clears throat> related to the desire by many emerging markets to have more than just a stock exchange or bonds listed on the, on an exchange as well. What they want is they want to have futures, options, ETFs, and of course, non-residents may also have bilateral derivative contracts, which relate to price movement of assets within the domestic market. So what we see is it's not the old days where you just bring in a stock exchange and then maybe 10, 20, 30 years later, these more sophisticated investor products would roll out. The reality is those markets are accessible today and markets want to participate and get the value of the trading and investing activity that results from things like derivative contracts. Of course, the role of securities lending there is that <clears throat> it provides revenues for ETFs because ETFs uh, lend out the underlying portfolios in order to generate income to either reduce the tracking error of the ETF to their index that they're tracking or to reduce the operating expenses of the ETF. But it's very critical for many ETFs and an essential part. They're one of the biggest communities of lenders that's out there. And within these derivative contracts, so although the derivative contracts themselves don't touch the cash markets of stocks and bonds, the reality is that many of the hedges that you need to put on to cover any derivative exposures you have will involve a short selling in the cash markets themselves. So you need to have that mechanism. So you can't really grow derivatives without short selling to the extent that uh, there is demand for it. ETFs, of course, they don't need securities lending because they don't need the revenue, but it certainly helps with tracking errors, as I said, or reducing operating expenses. And as I said, derivative contracts, they require hedges that involve short selling. And so if you can't hedge the position, you might not take out the derivative position in the first place, or you might not write a contract for your customer in a bilateral swap, say. Okay, so very important as part of the building blocks for the growth of 
uh, derivatives and ETFs. Finally, the other thing I forgot to mention that, of course, all of this also supports the regular cash market trading volume. So again, it goes into the liquidity, it goes into the price discovery uh, features that we just talked about. And so it's really another supportive tool because it adds ex extra volumes. Now, the next couple of slides, I hope I explain this. Okay. Cause this is sometimes hard for people to understand. If you think of markets that are peaking, they're just continually rising and rising. You get into a situation where as uh, Alan Greenspan talked about it in, uh, in late 1996, what he calls irrational exuberance, the stock market is going up at a much faster pace than the fundamentals of those securities would suggest that they should. And so what we see in markets generally, of course, he said that in 1996, and then a few years later, the dot-com boom turned into a dot-com bust. And so it was very prescient because it foretold the idea that, look, at some point, someone's going to hold these companies to account. They did, and markets crashed. The So what you have is as markets rise, short sellers start getting involved and they start saying, you know what, this market doesn't look like it makes any sense to me. So I'm going to start putting some short sales on to really hedge my positions so that in the event that there is a market correction of some type, even if I like my core portfolio, I'll have some downside protection from the short positions that I've actually put on. All right. So what happens is instead of just continually going up and up, what you have is a little bit of a moderating influence. So it doesn't go quite as high as it would have done and reduces the, this probably the speed and the degree of a fall in a market correction. So securities lending, of course, is required to support the short selling activity. And ultimately what you're talking about here is that market peaks are lowered and that's a good thing. So even though some people miss out on the very top, what you have is fewer people are impacted and the fall is less dramatic. The flip side of that, of course, is that when markets are crashing, of course, short sellers jump onto the bandwagon. Maybe they're part of the group that is in the first wave of selling that actually hits onto that. In any case, their volumes add on to the trend and accelerate the trend downward and maybe steep and happen, <clears throat> make it happen more quickly. But of course, the difference with a short seller in a falling market and a long investor that's just selling out of their portfolio is we know the short seller at some point has to buy those shares back. They have to do that to book their profits. And of course, what they're also looking for is opportunistic oversold positions where they say, that's a great company. It was a, not a great company at this price, but it's fallen 20%. Now it's a great company. So they're also buying. And you have to understand the psyche of many institutional investors where what they're benchmark is they need to outperform someone that looks like them. So if you're an insurance company, it's another insurance company. If you are a mutual funder, an ETF, it's another mutual funder, an ETF there. If you are running a, um, an active management portfolio, you'll be benchmarked to an index. And, and what you want to do is even if the market falls 20%, if you can say, I only fell 18%, that's outperformance. And so it changes the way that, that people think. So in a falling market, they're not interested in buying with everyone's selling. So are they, because they're going along with the crowd. Whereas a hedge fund will also be looking to not only benefit from the profits as prices fall in the short sales, but also look to buy, to go long, not just short, but they may shift from going short to long. And they're the buyers. So what that creates is uh, this sector really provides support in falling markets, not initially, not through the main body of it, but as you start getting past that sort of huge drop, huge falls, they become the buyers. They become some of the only buyers in the market. And they're what they do then, of course, is they have the leveling effect the other way. So on the way up, they're making certain it doesn't go as high as it would otherwise on the way down, they're actually uh, smoothing out the bottom of the trough. As I said, most institutional investors are benchmarked against each other rather than doing absolute returns. So it's really groupthink. Oops, sorry about that. So it's really groupthink. And so what you have from a regulatory perspective is markets that don't go as high as they might do, 
markets that don't fall as low as they might do because of the moderating influence of short sellers. So it trades within a narrower band, fewer extremes, and that's good for regulators. That's good for the overall marketplace. That's good for exchanges because of the extra volume. And it's good for investors because you have more trading opportunity, more buyers, more sellers, more input for price discovery. These are our courses, the free course on primer on securities lending. We also have a free primer on re repos. We're, I'm still hopefully recording this, this one up in the right-hand corner there. Hopefully I'll get finished recording that sometime towards the end of this coming week. And we have the big course, the introduction to securities lending, which is eight courses, an exam, and you get a really strong grounding in securities lending in quite detail. And of course it has uh, CPD credits with it as well. So the summary, emerging markets, the objectives as to why they bring it in, liquidity, short sellers bring additional long and short trading volumes, not just short positions. By having short sellers introducing different markets, investors have better informed views and can make better decisions on the right price to pay for a stock if they're buying or the right price to sell it at if they're selling. Short selling and securities lending supports the introduction and growth of derivatives and ETFs. You can't have, you can't really have a robust derivative market without securities lending and short selling. And of course the peak trough, which I just talked about. Short sellers have a moderating influence on market activity during extreme periods, extreme upwards, extreme downwards. They bring it into a narrower band and that's a better marketplace. So fundamentally, that's it. Emerging markets and securities lending uh, next week, part two. Thanks for everyone uh, that has been watching this either live or on replay. Appreciate you being with me. Hope you have a great Saturday. Hope you have a great weekend. Hope you have a great week. And I hope to see you next week. Thanks and goodbye.